The Bear premiered on Hulu and FX last year, 2022, and has since then had two incredible seasons. Let's break down this excellent television show about a chef trying to bring life back into his family restaurant. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today, we are finally doing The Bear. We have gotten so many requests from you to review this excellent TV series. And as two people who used to work in the service industry, in restaurants, I can tell you it's accurate as fuck. I remember I, I put off watching the show because... The trailer was so accurate, it gave me PTSD of working in that world. <laughs> and then I just... I think you just like making excuses to not watch TV shows, <laughs> Anthony, honestly. Yeah, I can't watch it because it's a fictional show about the back of house. You were front of house. Yeah, I was front of house. But, I mean, you still interact with the back of house a lot. And no matter where you work in a restaurant, it's always stressful. Unless, like, you're the host, it's not too stressful. It's still, like, stressful. It can be. When it's busy. But it's not as bad as front of house and back of house, like, servers and then cooks in line. Hostesses and, and, right now listening to you, Anthony. It's complicated. <laughs> Anthony is just wow. You're you're terrible today, man. Already. <laughs> <laughs> hey, facts, man. Singling people out. I'm just saying, hosts spend a lot of time on their phones. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> and not busy restaurants, sure. Not busy restaurants, but working, Cheesecake Factory. They're working their butts off. They're working their tails off. They are. <laughs> but the restaurant industry is a very unique kind of industry where. You know, when you're there as a guest, you expect things to be really smooth, uh, and you hope that things are kind of in a way perfect. The food's done well, the service is great, and all around, you want your experience to be good. And restaurants, what's fascinating about them is on the surface, they can present that, but in the background, it is quite the opposite. It's a war zone, it's chaos, it's madness, <laughs> and it's really fucking stressful. And the bear did a really excellent job of portraying that behind the scenes look behind a restaurant. A lot of people's lives are like that too. There's a facade, but there's <laughs> madness behind the eyes and the, what really goes on. Now the bear, again, like Anthony said, so many of you have been trying to get us to watch this show for like two years. Finally got around to it. I got a Hulu subscription for a month. Free trial. <laughs> it was so good. I'm, I really enjoyed the show and second season was excellent. They really got into a groove with the characters and story arcs. And on IMDb, the bear is an 8.6. It is number 189 on IMDb's top-rated TV shows of all time, which is pretty excellent I think for a new show. I think that's about standard. Yeah, that's I mean, how I would. I mean, there's a lot of TV yeah, shows to be in the top 200 ones. all yeah. time. That's that's fucking awesome. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes. It's a 99 percent. The first season was 100. The second season was 99 percent critic score, 92 percent audience score. It has 18 episodes over two seasons. The first season is eight episodes, which is pretty standard for TV series. And then the second season was 10 episodes. They even had an hour-long one in there. That Christmas episode was excellent. And then 13 Emmy nominations. It hasn't gotten a win yet, but tons of recognition for nominations as well. Some critics awards for some of the actors. Iowa Debris won one, I think, this year. And then uh, Jeremy Allen White won that last year. Yeah, she won Rising Star, yeah. It was created by Christopher Storer who directs a lot of the episodes and writes them as well. And the showrunner is Joanna Kahlo. The Bear is an American comedy drama created by Christopher Storer, premiered on Hulu, which is owns FX now, because Disney owns everything. So Disney owns The Bear. <laughs> <laughs> premiered on June 23rd, 2022, starring Jeremy Allen White as a young award-winning chef who returns to his hometown of Chicago <laughs> to manage the chaotic kitchen at his deceased brother's sandwich shop, The Beef. The supporting cast includes Evan Moss Backrack, Io Debri, Lionel Boyce, Liza Colon Zayas, Abby Elliott, and Maddie Matheson. Backrack sounds funny. Is it Bacharach, maybe? Probably Bacharach. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs> He's awesome, by the way. He's from Amherst, Massachusetts. No way! Yeah, he. His family's from Springfield and Amherst. Holy crap. He went crap. to college in Springfield. He's, I think he's the best actor in the show. He's terrific. The Represent. sandwich shop interior is actually copied from the real life Chicago shop, Mr. Beef on Orleans. In River North, I'm assuming that's a street in Chicago, <laughs> the creator, Christopher Storer, was a frequent patron and a friend of the owner's son. The series has received widespread critical acclaim, particularly for its writing, directing, acting, and production values, as well as its examination of its subject matter. And basically, again, a quick synopsis, a little more detailed. Young chef Carmen Carmi Berzato inherits his family's Italian beef sandwich shop after the suicide of his older brother, Michael. He comes home to Chicago to run it, leaving behind his world of working in a Michelin-starred restaurant in New York. He is left to deal with his brother's unresolved debts, a rundown kitchen, 
and an unruly staff while dealing with his own pain and family trauma. Now, I see why it's 186 ranked all time because I 189, will, I 189. I will say the first season took a little time to get going. And to, it took until, I would say, episode six and seven where I think the show finally found its footing and understood what it was. Sometimes shows, they need a little time to really figure out what exactly it is. You know, they'll have a pilot and then they'll work out the rest of the scripts and then they'll shoot the rest of the this whole season. But it really... I think with something like that, with new people who haven't done TV before, you're trying to figure out what is our what is our tone, what, how are we filming, what exactly is this? And I think it took them a few episodes to figure that out because I will say I wasn't completely sold on the show in the first few episodes. I was like, oh, it's good, but it's not living up to the hype that everybody was, has been saying online. But... You know, you gotta trust people's opinions, and so I gave it. I, I stuck it out, and by the end of the first season, I was completely sold. And I thought it was fantastic. And then season two, I think, was an absolutely huge improvement on the first season in every possible way. And I think it really um, elevated it to a really fantastic, excellent TV show. I'm looking forward to season three. I can't wait to watch it. And I can now see why FX greenlit the second season in like a half a day. They're like, oh, get another one going. Before we get back into the episode, we are doing a movie poster giveaway thanks to our friends at MoviePosters.com. So be sure to enter this contest by making a comment on the YouTube episode of The Bear. So go to our YouTube channel and make a comment in The Bear episode that enters you into the contest to win a free movie poster from MoviePosters.com. I agree. It's not that I didn't like the first season. I loved every yeah. episode. I like every episode of the show. They're really great. But the great ones, most of the great episodes are in season two. Season one has an episode. I'll go over some of the ranking ratings of over a nine on IMDb. But there's four in season two that are over nine on IMDb. And you're right. It takes a little while to get used to the characters to, for them to figure out what's going on with the story. What are the story arcs going to be? What are the character interactions and relationships going to be like? But they really figured out by the end of season two, it was really cooking pun intended it was working so well and i think the cast is excellent it's the best part of the show so jeremy allen white's basically whenever a studio says we need someone who can play a character who's always stressed out with a messed up family jeremy allen white is your guy you watched his um other shameless. shameless right yeah, yeah yeah so basically that's the joke was he was he a kid when he started shameless not or, a kid he was probably he's like a, a early adult like uh -huh. late teenager he was supposed to be in high school when that show started so, but he was like 20 gotcha gotcha I mean, he's like he, our age he's probably. our age right now yeah. so like 32 33. but he was great in that show He's excellent. Uh -huh. He plays Lip. And so Lip is like the precocious, like super smart, but like troubled and stressed out. Well, that whole family. He's the hustler, right? Kind. Yeah. I mean, that's a way to put it. Uh -huh. I wouldn't say he's like, he's like, he's like, always got something going on. Okay, but he's yeah, gotcha. really smart. But also the family dynamic is similar because they're always fighting. They're loyal, but they all hate each other. So it's kind of like, that's the joke a studio need. You need someone who lives <laughs> in a stressed out family. Jeremy Allen White's your guy with some messy hair. He plays Carmi, Carmen Berzado, the award winning chef. From New York City, De Cuisine, who returns to his hometown, obviously, to run the beef. I got my Carmi outfit on today. It looks like you <laughs> got the navy pants. You should have got the, some white stains seat. on your on your shirt. You yeah, I should wear an apron. I didn't have the slip-ons, but I put on loafers just to try and get close to the slip-ons. I did uh, the messy Carmi hair. Yeah, you got my the hair. Hair's getting long again, and I just like did the best I could to make. Uh -huh. Does it look silly? It does look silly. You, look you're looking more like Burnthal with the the. Uh, Oh, the hair. thanks. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I like that. You got Burnthal's hair more than Alan White's. That's a that's a good compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and then Didn't we have, say you look like him. <laughs> you said hair. I mean, I'm no, just, actually, no. I'm feeling like a little Burnthal vibe with if you. I, it's because the tan. Yeah, you are tan. tan You're way more the tan. The tan, than me. I'm pretty lean right now, so I got the Barenthal <laughs> thing going on. But I'm not as cool as Barenthal. He's a pretty cool guy. Now, Evan Moss Bakrock plays Richard Richie Jeremovich. He is so good in this show. And all these rumors about him being cast in the Fantastic Four make total sense to me now because he's sensational. Oh, as the thing. That's who it is. I, I heard it would, could be that or I don't maybe not Mr. Fantastic for him. I, I read that he was going to be the thing. I, I mean, I could yeah. see that. So he plays the de facto manager of the beef. It really should be Jeremy Allen White, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael's best friend. And obviously, he's basically a brazado, not by blood, but by friendship. And Richie's a mess. And I love his, he has the best character arc, I think, because of how low he is when we meet him, how much of an asshole he is, how stubborn he is, how hard he is to communicate and get along with. By the end of season two, he is a completely changed person, and his perspective on life has changed. He's really the only character that transforms. Everyone else, they they change, but he he did he does a nosedive 180 because of that episode where Carmi sends him to the fine dining 
um, three star restaurant that Karma used to run. Forks. That's the name of the Forks. episode. Um, excellent episode because he's never understood the fine dining lifestyle and what it is. He's always looked at it as pretentious and fancy. But that episode did a great job of translating. It's not just about being fancy and expensive. It the fine dining that we see in that restaurant, especially, is taking hospitality and customer service to the fucking maximum of them like getting Uno's of get them getting deep dish pizza for a guest because they overheard it and like showcasing that yes that it's expensive but like it's more it's just as much about the service and the hospitality as it is about the food and that's what he really he he saw that he comes back he goes cuz I get it I get it cuz and it's not just about fine dining but it's also about for him a new perspective on life purpose and he changes in terms of like he cleans up his house. I wear now. suits now. Yeah, so it's like it, it was like a personality shift for yeah. him to kind of it was a wake up call in a Grow lot of up. ways for yeah. for Richie because he's 45. 40, yeah, yeah, 44, yeah. 45. No purpose. Yeah, yo, bruh, yo, cuz I got no purpose. What's my purpose? <laughs> we have Io Debris as Sydney Adamu, a talented but inexperienced chef who joins the beef as its new sous chef under Carmi. Io was excellent. We got to interview her. Um, a few like a month ago for TMNT TMNT which was awesome and she's terrific in this show she's a highlight of the show and I think when her and Jeremy Allen White are going at it it's some of my favorite scenes of they're just extremely talented actors and they both have a great nuance and authenticity and realism and honesty to their acting they feel like real people when they're sharing scenes it, it I think the show is on fire absolutely then Lionel Boyce as Marcus Brooks who is the bread baker turned pastry chef Spurred on by Carmi's and Sydney's mentoring and inspiration. We have Liza colon Zayas as Tina Marrero, who is one of my favorite characters. Whenever Tina's on screen, especially season two, she's so sweet and cute. And I'm always smiling whenever she, she's got a great smile. She's so sweet. She's the mom. Terrific actress. Yeah. And I love Tina so, so much. She's a uh, uh, sharp but stubborn veteran line cook. We have Abby Elliott as Natalie Sugar Rose Berzado, Carmi and Michael's sister, and reluctant owner, co-owner of the beef and eventually of the bear. And Maddie Matheson as Neil Fack. Fack! <laughs> a childhood friend of the Berzados and sometimes handyman for a restaurant. Tons of recurring characters. I mean, John Barenthal is one of the great guest stars of this show. And when it comes to great guest stars, I think it's one of the great strengths of the bear, especially season two. We have Molly Ringwald. As the meeting met moderator of the Al Anon meetings. Oh my God! Carmi intends now the Al Anon. I those thought are, she looked familiar. Yeah, so Al Anon, they're basically Alcoholics Anonymous meetings or, or NA meetings for the people that addicts affect, the family members, the friends of addicts and alcoholics. It's for them to be able to go and communicate and try to. Okay, I, basically a form of therapy. For some reason, I thought it was. NA meetings. No. But he was just going as to understanding it's, it's the world. If you're like if you have a friend or a uh -huh. loved one who's an who's an addict Got or an it. alcoholic, so yeah. obviously people have experience with Al that's the difference between Al Anon versus AA. Oh, because non, you're non you're a non addict, but you're still Well it's still anonymous. It's yeah. just they word it differently. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now Will Poulter as Luca in season two, he plays that Copenhagen based dessert chef who trains Marcus, which is excellent in episode Two. He's such a good actor. Honey, he's he's fucking, great. He's great. And then Bob Odenkirk as Uncle Lee Lane. Don is scheming on and off boyfriend and business partner of Cicero and Berzato's late father. Season two, we have that Fishes episode, the Christmas episode. He's awesome. When I saw Bob Odenkirk on screen, I'm like, Bob Odenkirk? <laughs> Holy shit. We also have Jamie Lee Curtis plays Carmi, Michael, and Natalie's mom in this show. Donna. Terrific yeah. in the Fishes episode. Then we get her in the finale briefly. John Mulaney comes in hot as Michelle's boyfriend, Michelle, played by Sarah Paulson. She's Michelle Berzato, cousin of Michael, Carmi, and Natalie. She lives in New York. She tries to get Carmi away from Chicago. And then Olivia Coleman as Chef Terry, the executive chef at Ever, that fine dining restaurant where Richie stages in season two, episode Forks. And also Jillian Jacobs yes. as Richie's um, baby mama. And then uh, Oliver Platt, did you mention? Oliver Platt, huh? he's fantastic, Uncle Jimmy. Uh, he's, oh, you got a you got a nomination for. A, I think he might have won. I think he's excellent in the show. It's one of my favorite Oliver Platt performances, and it's funny because we just watched Chef, and he plays the food critic in Chef. Yeah, it's, it's kind of so funny. I, I, it was just so funny. He seems to fit in the in the cooking world, and because of that movie, I I, I, I make it's, food is synonymous with Oliver Platt now for some reason in my mind. But he's I think he's excellent as Uncle Jimmy as this the money man. 
as this guy who has ties to you know shady dealings uh, he, i wouldn't uh, say shady he's got connections richie calls him a blue collar criminal he's got connections he's a blue collar collar criminal <laughs> he is he's he and then um carmy says what he doesn't want to get his legs cut up broken yeah because of uncle jimmy but it, it's great because it's an italian american family we we come from a mostly Italian American family. It can be pretty crazy. It's pretty nuts. But also the Irish side's pretty wild too. It's well, it's funny because we grew up in such a hectic life. Yeah. Our house and family parties. So like as soon as I started watching the show, I'm like I'm getting PTSD from yeah. from the hectic life we grew up in in the house. Of Our just, mom's not Donna, but the the house was still crazy. It was in, there yeah. was a lot of people and yeah. not a lot of space, and yeah. it was loud, and fights, angry, and yeah. everyone was irritable. So like it's literally I felt like I was in my childhood watching this show every episode. I'm like, <laughs> All right, this looks really familiar. But it did a the show does a really really fantastic job of portraying the food industry, the food service industry, uh, really accurately. And there are a lot of things that I took away from the film that maybe if you've never worked, it's in, a show, Anthony. Not I'm a sorry, film. from the show. Sorry, <laughs> have it. This is like only the eighth show we've talked about. <laughs> from the show that if you haven't worked behind the scenes of the service industry, you might not be aware of and. Things like getting in the weeds. Getting in the weeds is when you're so busy you can't even fucking think. And you see it a lot in this show because it's such a constant presence where uh, in a, working in a restaurant, when you see it so many times, there's it's slow, but then when it's busy, when it's full, you are full throttle. You can't even think about what you're doing. You just have to move on to the next tax, task, whether you're expoing. So something that Sydney does often in the, sh in the, in the restaurant is expoing. She's the one you know, telling people what to make, saying... Um, six chickens all day. That means that six chickens need to be cooking right now. They didn't just get ordered, but maybe we or she ordered four chickens uh, two minutes ago, and then two more chickens got ordered. So now the expoer is telling the cook six chickens all day. So we need six chickens cooking at the moment. That's what that all day phrase means. But she's the she's working the expo line. She's calling out dishes. She's getting food runners to run food, and that's a very stressful job. And it and it even gets even more complex. It gets even more complex in the fine dining setting, which Richie sees, and then obviously Sydney has experience with, which is why she at first handles it when they open the bear on its opening night for friends and family. But the expo line is really crazy. But even more so, the the food cooks line is just madness. It's it's so hot. There's so many dishes on the line. There's so many things that they have to do. Whether and then not only cooking dishes, but modifications to dishes, allergies. There's so many things happening, and in a way. They're, when you the restaurant's busy, the employees they can't even think. They just have to focus on the next objective, and that's why we see multiple times there's a there's a sign that says every second counts. You can't waste a second in a restaurant, especially a, a five a three star or a one star or a fine dining restaurant where people expect the best. Not a second can be wasted because even five seconds ruins the dish. We see in the meeting how. They said that there was an issue that cost them 47 seconds. And the cook's like, don't you dare fucking make us cost. You know, but you know how bad that is? Like 47 <laughs> seconds? It sounds ridiculous from the outside perspective, but 47 seconds is life or death in the busy restaurant. And on top of that, there are a lot of bad days in restaurants behind the scenes. They're almost always bad Yeah, they're days. almost always bad. <laughs> and in a way, if, if your restaurant's busy, it's going to be bad. There's no way around that, but... What you see in the film in the show <laughs> is so many of the characters, no matter how stressed they get, no matter, no matter how chaotic it is, at the end of the day, they love what they do. They love serving. And then little things like when people cook, when some of the chefs cook things and they watch someone eat their food, like when Sydney cooks for sugar that omelet. Oh my God, it looks so good. And Sydney's in, it's, it's a stressful day for her. It's opening um, night. And she cooks the omelet for sugar, and, and she watches her cook the. Uh, she watches Sid, uh, sugar eat it, and like that's what it's all about. And then when Richie sees how the extremely high service level of the fancy three star restaurant changes, it just makes people feel so happy. Like first of all, when they say, uh, "Oh, this couple, they've been dying to come here. We're not. They're not paying. It's free." When when we see. The guy training Richie tells the couple at the table they're like crying. They're so happy. And then he sees how happy the other table is for getting the, the deep dish pizza. He understands that as crazy as the world is, when they the whole the whole point behind it, and even seeing that crazy chef for that restaurant, he's a psycho, but then he puts so much care into transforming that deep dish into a beautiful dish for the guests. He sees that at the end of the day, it's all about making people 
have a wonderful experience and remember that night. And at the end, then that's what it's all about. The show has terrific production elements too. I want to talk about the music. So it has a great soundtrack of songs from the '80s, '90s, 2000s, alternative, mainstream rock classics, as well as some bangers. We have Radiohead's "Let Down" in there, Van Morrison's "Saint Dominic's Preview." We have that great song that like yeah, it's like a theme. Yeah, it's kind of like the theme. Whenever shit's hitting the fan, you hear that guitar riff, and then the ba 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 ba. That's New Noise by Refused, and the soundtrack slaps, so I recommend checking it out on Spotify or wherever you listen to music and shit. They got a better budget second season because yeah. they had some high-level high, tr- high yeah. level tracks. R.E.M.'s Oh My Heart is on here as well. The replacements, Bastards of Young, Counting Crows, Have You Seen Me Lately? So the soundtrack for this series is terrific. There's a bunch of great songs, but I think that great chaotic song by the Refused by Refused is like a great kind of theme, like you said, for the show, as well as when it comes to production, I really like how they approach this show. It's not perfect, but it works in a great way to its benefit. So I like the approach to cinematography. Lots of imperfect zooms as well as push-ins that are kind of choppy, but it works for the chaos of the show. It works for the grittiness of the show as well as— Yeah, mostly long lenses. Yeah, and we're in these tight, compact spaces. You get the sense of claustrophobia. I love the intimacy of the show because when you're a back house of a kitchen— it is tight back there, and you can't really walk. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta yell corner. You gotta stay behind, and they get all those elements in there. But it's, it's really great to make it. Fe- they make it feel a lot bigger than it really is back there. But that's because it's just great production and great intimacy with the characters. They do a great job of when people are moving through the spaces, constantly yelling corner and behind, and showing how you, there are turns and you gotta bob and weave, and there's always someone doing something right next to you that you're trying to get past, and how easy it is to drop something or spill something and how the close quarters nature of it is kind of like a battlefield it's kind of like uh, it's just a, a mad g- conglomeration of like all sorts of like cookware furniture shelving ovens and then people and there's no space and it's just like you gotta f- find your way through it and even if it's not working hours even if the restaurant's not running you still, if you're walking past someone, yell behind. That's just like it becomes part of your DNA where you just, whenever you pass somebody, you say something. And it it, it seeps into your real life, too, where you start saying it sometimes. Yes. Great uh, photography of the city of Chicago. Every time I see the Chicago in, in a movie or TV show, I think of The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight but yeah, they did same. get a lot of great parts of Chicago that I'd never seen before on screen. So I think they do a great, inter- great interesting job of capturing moments the of train, Chicago. The train, the high-rise, what's it called? The, um, so the... It's um, it's the the train line that's up uh, up a high. It's high. What's it called? You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Something line. It's got a special name, but like they're famous. It's famous for being in Chicago. Also, the food. It always looks terrific. And I think my favorite part about how they shoot the food is they're not afraid to not focus on the food and rather focus on the chefs. Of course, we get some great shots of cooking and food, but rather than just constantly getting shots of the food being prepared, they're focusing on the chefs usually, which I think is the right decision to get when you're capturing these moments in these scenes. They also do cool things with the editing in terms of trying to illustrate what people are thinking and what's in their minds, whether it be memories or ideas. So you see Sydney, she's trying to come up with menu ideas and she's picturing styles of cooking, foods to cook in her mind. And she figures out the cold braise and we get to see a couple insert shots of close-ups of a slow braise and things like that. And then for Carmi, his past, when he's thinking about something, we're seeing the visuals of what he's thinking. We're also hearing the voices because I think what they do a good job is, is when you interact with people, sometimes you can... Or if when you're thinking about someone, you're thinking about the past memories and past interactions and things they said that really stuck stuck out with you, and whatever context it is, those those phrases will will linger with you, and if they can be negative memories, those will really just like haunt you in a way, and so we see that in a great way with with Carmi and his mind. I love being able to see what's going on in that head of his. That's causing all the stress and anxiety same with sydney we get some moments of what she's thinking about like you said but and also the moments of like thinking about claire or thinking about sydney and there's that montage where he thinks about both of them and he's trying to calm himself he's thinking about claire and these kind of just like memory dreamlike sequences and then thinking about the moments he has had with sydney it's it's really great editing as well as kind of just when they're walking around town cool editing to the music and just fast montages by the way speaking of claire uh the guys call her claire bear yeah i just watched wedding crashers and um, 
It's uh, Rachel McAdams' character is named Claire, and everyone calls her Claire That's Bear. That's right. <laughs> I was like, wait, they just they say that in The Bear. I just watched it. Like, the odds of me watching that after The Bear with the same character being called, same person being called Claire Bear, I thought it was pretty funny. I think my favorite little detail about this show, which is everywhere, but maybe not everyone notices it right away, but obviously by season two, you really start to notice it, especially opening night in the episode of The Bear, the last the last episode, last two episodes. The Pepto-Bismol and Tums everywhere. Whenever you're stressed and it, your brain and stomach are connected, and my goodness, the first episode has shots. Carmi's kitchen has Pepto and Tums. His bathroom has Tums. He's chewing Tums, drinking Pepto. I think it's such a great and smart detail to have because it's so accurate. I mean... A lot of times, people they're, they're, they have these stomach aches, and they may not know it's related to their stress. Anxiety causes yeah. stomach problems. That's absolutely a fact. There's another thing that is a result of anxiety and stress of working in a kitchen or a restaurant that everybody suffers from, and it's serving nightmares. <laughs> we see a bunch of serving nightmares in this film. And cooking nightmares. Yeah, cooking yeah. nightmares. Uh, there's a couple of them. One of them, Carmi, is it's like a waking nightmare where he actually where he accidentally sets a fire in his own kitchen but then we see other nightmares with sydney has one carmy has a couple but serving nightmares everybody gets them and it's you're dreaming you're at work and the most insane thing is happening it's everything's dialed to 11 and there's nothing you can do about it and because it's the stress feeds into you and the anxiety feeds into you because working in a restaurant when it's busy is just extreme stress you take that with you, especially when you go home. My, my, I had a recurring serving nightmare where I would be working in the restaurant and I would get sat like 20 tables in a row, like table after table after table after table, and everybody would be mad at me for not being able to serve them and nobody would help. And then I couldn't even figure, I couldn't remember how to sign into the computer to, to put the orders in. And it's just like everything that can go wrong does go wrong. And that's something that I I had a recurring that recurring dream over and over again while working in restaurants. So that's another part of of serving life that the show translates into screen that you might not be aware of. In mental health, the show yeah. does a great job approaching mental health. And Carmi's you know waking nightmares of the fire. It's all related to his source of stress and anxiety in his life is this restaurant. And if he just let this fire go and this place burned down, the source of all his stress and anxiety would disappear. And he's enticed by the idea of letting it happen. Just like Michael was planning to burn down the beef, he fucked up the gas line so that he could burn down the beef eventually. Like, that was his plan. That's why they had that issue with the gas lines when they're trying to open up the bear in season two. And so it's interesting that, you know, Carmi, he, he loves chaos, but he hates it. He obviously hates what it does to him, but he's addicted to chaos because it's all he's ever known. His whole entire life has been chaos, has been anxiety, has been stress, has been stress. <laughs> and that's why he's so addicted to chaotic work environments. That's why even though he hates it, he loves it. He can't walk away from it. He can't give up cooking in a kitchen where he's being berated and being attacked. Yeah, Uncle Jimmy has that great line where you're going to like work, you're going to be here every day, spend all your time here, get kicked in the nuts night after night does that sound, that sound good to you yeah. Carmi's like yeah i guess so so speaking of chaos i think that's what the bear represents so we get the bear being let out of the cage on the bridge in chicago by Carmi in the opening i think that represents him letting the chaos out letting the monster out and the bear is it can't be tamed it, and maybe he will be able to tame it one day and that's why the nickname for everybody in the family they call each other bear because that's inside of their blood. It's in their it's in their history. It's in their genes. That that madness. That 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 anger. That that ferocity. The power. The speed. <laughs> the dark night rises. <laughs> I see but the league, league of, of shadows, shadows and resurgent. resurgent. <laughs> but that's I think what the bear represents. That innate chaos that they can't help but uh, control. They can't control. Maybe they will one day. Maybe Carmen will be able to control himself one day. But. As long as that bear is outside the cage, he's never going to be able to have a, a tamed life in a way. Not completely just chaos. I mean, obviously, bear is, relates to their last name, Berzato. So that's a nickname and play on the word. Show opens with Carmi and that bear on the bridge. That's the first shot of scene of the, of the show in season one. But also in Fish's episode, they're talking about bears, and we learn 
that bears are empathetic, they're altruistic, they're sensitive, they're devoted, but also aggressive, which obviously these words, they relate to the Berzados, the family dynamic, how chaotic and aggressive they are, but also how loyal and devoted they are to each other. They all love each other very much, even though they scream at each other every single day. <laughs> Just like bears are aggressive, but also very sweet and devoted. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I was waiting for, I was like, oh, when's the restaurant going to be called the bear? I felt like that's going to, I was like, in season one, I was like, they got to call this thing the bear one day. I liked it. I think it was the waiting for the end yeah. of season two was perfect. I thought it was But excellent. like we knew it was going to happen halfway through yeah. season two. And then the fishes episode when he shows Michael the, 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 drawings. the drawing he had yeah. made in frame form of the bear, the restaurant that they always talked about opening up. And, you know, Michael and Carmi, they have this beautiful and, and chaotic relationship as well. And Michael's death and suicide is a huge part of Carmen's issues and his trauma, not to mention the way that he feels Michael is treating him. You know, tr Michael's his hero. You can tell. I mean, your older brothers are your heroes for a long time. And he looked up to Michael, and all he wanted to do was work at the restaurant, work at the beef with Michael that Michael took over for the family. And then he thought that Michael was rejecting him because he didn't want him. And he doesn't. we don't find out until Fish's episode, really, that Michael didn't want him to work there basically because he was protecting him. He knew Carmen was too good for it. He didn't want Carmen to live this goddamn life of working in this Italian beef shop. Not that there's anything wrong with it. He called it a nightmare. He called yeah. it a nightmare, exactly. But Carmen took it as a rejection. He took it as, all right, motivation, fuck you. Watch what I can do. Becomes one of the best chefs in the world, working the best restaurant on the planet. And then, again, he doesn't realize that Michael was protecting him and basically set him up to do whatever he wanted. I don't know if Michael's grand plan was eventually to take his life, if he had that planned out that far in advance, hiding this money in all those cans of sauce and waiting for Carmi to take over eventually. Who knows? But obviously he left that money there for, Mike, for Carmen to find and that was basically his plan and keeping in the small cans of tomato sauce was really funny because yeah. Carmen's like, why are we using the small cans? You get more with the 110 ounces. Why does he get these 28 ounce cans? And then he leaves the, when he finds the suicide note, yeah, yeah. let it rip. He gives him the recipe for the spaghetti, use the small cans, they taste better, finds the money. I think Michael's original plan was to take the money from Jimmy and keep it hidden for a while. So he hid it in the, in the tomato cans. Tomato. Tomato cans. And I think his plan was to burn the restaurant down and then take insurance money plus Jimmy's money to build something new or to just get out, just move with the money, just take all that money and run. So I think that was his original plan. But then life got so hard for him. He became such a bad addict and he couldn't deal with life anymore. He decided he was going to kill himself. And he's like, you know what? What can I do? For Carmi, I can leave. I can tell him about the money. I can hint at the money being there. I don't think I don't think he planned for that long to kill himself, but I think that he planned to maybe run away with a ton of money, possibly. I think I think I like your idea of burning it down and starting something fresh, probably for Carmen and with Carmen. But I think you're right. Where eventually life wore down, wore him down so much that he decided to commit suicide and left the restaurant to Carmen, which everyone was confused about, especially Carmi, not understanding why he left him the beef if he never wanted him to work at the beef. Yeah, in the in. Mikey's a great example of some like you hear so many stories of like someone who um, commits suicide of being like such a a great presence and they would light up a room and they were so full of energy and Robin seemed, Williams yeah man. Robin Williams and you hear that about the um, the actor from Euphoria I read stories and like the, his friends and castmates said that he was like like a a, a son of energy and and positivity. And you hear that a lot, and I think Mikey, especially with the performance by John Bernthal, is a great depiction of that, of someone who, because they have so much darkness within inside of them, when they project the opposite to other people, and Mikey, I think, is a great example of that, because everybody says he's so much fun, he... He he makes he can read a room. He's everybody. People keep saying he's hilarious, and and he is like he. If if there's a party, he's the life of the party, and he's like the ringleader, and he's always this kind of like the center of attention because he's just so good with people. But in a way, he's projecting all of that because of how bad he feels inside. The final shot of season one kills me. It's so tragic and beautiful because. Richie finally gives Carmi that note that he found behind the locker. It was basically a suicide note in a way for Carmen to find. Let it rip, dude. Gives him the recipe. And then Carmen finds the money. And 
And then the episode ends where he's thinking about Mikey, and it cuts to a flashback of Mikey, John Bernthal, smiling and laughing. And then the, the show ends, and I got, like, goosebumps. I got really emotional. It was a really beautiful way to end season one. Let it rip. Let it rip, dude. Yeah. I thought that was really fantastic. Also, Mikey is a Red Sox fan. Oh, yeah, I love so it. So there are Fenway Park signs all over the place. It's Mikey's team. Show some respect. <laughs> <laughs> also... I'm not sure if you noticed there are a couple of movie posters. Yeah, there's so many. So, Everyone's got great taste. Yeah. I love the one in Sydney's house. Which one is that? Sydney in her apartment, she has... Well, oh, it was uh, Speed. Speed, yes. She has Speed, speed in her bedroom. Yes, Speed. Uh, Richie has an alien poster in his bedroom. But my favorite one was there's a Rounders poster. Yeah. In the basement of the bear was Mikey's poster. But Rounders actually has a lot of similarities to this show. You know, uh, Carmi's taking on the debt of someone from his past that he loves, uh, he's taking on Mikey's debt, and he's trying to figure out how to pay it back. And then you can look at Richie as Edward Norton's character, kind of just being this troublemaker, gets arrested, he's unreliable, he's uh, uh, uncontrollable. And so the Rounders has a lot of similarities to the Bear, so I think that's why they put that poster. Plus, because Rounders is a fucking awesome movie. We should do it sometime. We're going to do a poker, poker episode. Poker episode would be fun. Poker episode. But I see a lot of similarities between the Bear's storyline and characters and Rounders' storyline and characters. And how about we run to our intermission, and then we'll get back to the Bear. There's still so much to talk about. And Let's before we it. continue, the very best way you can support Raiders of the Lost podcast is to share us with your family and friends who love movies, who love TV. If anyone, anyone you know loves the Bear, send them this episode. They can check it out, and it'll probably make them want to watch it again because it's that good. <laughs> you can also leave five-star reviews and ratings on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. They help us get seen by new listeners on those apps. They push us and get us good rankings, so thank you for those reviews. I'll read out a five-star written review in just a minute from Apple Podcasts and becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a subscription-based form of support for the show. We have five different tiers of membership, $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. Every single tier has access to two bonus episodes of the show every week. Not to mention, we now have our own Spotify Patreon playlist. Finally, we integrated Patreon with Spotify. It's something we've been dying to do, so it's called Raiders of the Lost Patreon. If you have a Patreon account with us, you can link your Spotify and listen on the Spotify app to over 200 bonus episodes of the show, and every tier has awesome perks. That $10 gets you access to our Discord and going up the ranks even better things. So thank you so much to everyone who supports our show through Patreon. It's the only reason we can do it full time. And this episode is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order today. They have a giant selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. In this episode, we're going to be doing a movie poster giveaway. To enter this giveaway... All you have to do is make a comment on our Bear episode on YouTube that enters you into the contest to win a free poster. Again, make a comment on our YouTube channel on the Bear episode that enters you into the contest. We'll pick a winner in two weeks. And in the meantime, be sure to use MoviePosters.com for all of your poster needs and use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. All right, Anthony, let's get into our intermission and begin with the movie quote competition. You ready? Ready. This one's kind of easy, but it's just a great line. And uh, I did all TV shows for this. I'm Federal Agent Jack Bauer, and today is the longest day of my life. That show is so sick. They had some good seasons. First, like, three seasons of that show Late, were man. some of the best TV ever, man. It was a wild show, man. Everybody was watching it. We used to watch it, like, with most of our, most of our family. Yeah, it was, be like, it's 24 night. It's that's Wednesday how good night. TV shows used to be. Not that there still aren't good ones, but they were so good that, like, that's how good network TV used to be. The whole family's watching. Their, that show had some excellent seasons. And, it, I mean, without the streaming, there it had the event quality to it like going to a movie like oh it's, it's Monday Survivor's night. on at 9 you watching we're we gonna get in the living room we're all watching it <laughs> making <laughs> treats and stuff and like it's the only time you can watch it it's the only time you can watch it that's it or you can buy it on DVD like a year later alright here's my quote I check my messages every day when I come home from work my answering machine zero I got a blinking light because I don't have to sh I don't have shit from you I got my wife <laughs> I got my wife checking the messages every 45 minutes, <laughs> calling the office saying, has Brad apologized yet? Is there an apology message on the machine? I don't have jack shit. You know what? That's not how you treat people. <laughs> <laughs> so good. 
<laughs> this is Jonah Hill in The Wolf of Wall Street. Yep. <laughs> Talking about John Bernthal. Has Brad apologized yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so fucked up. <laughs> All right, guess this movie release here. Actually, what year did Lost premiere on TV? 2004. Yeah. Please, I'm a Lost guy, man. I'm a, <laughs> you are a Lost. I'm a Lost boy. I love Lost. You wish you were a Lost boy. You'd be a vampire. It's pretty dope, though. And they all died. Well, I wouldn't be like, that crew is irresponsible. Okay? You'd be like a good vampire? <laughs> yeah. You'd be like a nice guy. No, I'd be, I'd be a smart vampire. <laughs> I'd move from place to place. I mean, they stay in that same place. They, I mean, they attract it, a lot of attention. It's a matter of time. They're partying. They're causing trouble. They have interesting looks. Yeah, I mean, they they do nothing but draw attention to they're themselves. They're very vain. They're yeah. not incognito at they're all. They're ostentatious. Yeah. <laughs> they're inconspicuous. No, they're, they're conspicuous. conspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's uh movie release year is the movie Date Night. I wanted to challenge you with the movie that you love. <laughs> <laughs> See how much you love it. Date Night. When did it come out? 2018. 2010. 2010? Oh, my God. Oh, you were thinking. Oh, I was thinking. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking Game, game Night. night. <laughs> I also was thinking Game Night when I did it. Oh, I Date know. Night's the Corel. Gotcha. Tina Fey one. Gotcha, yeah. That's 2010. I've never even seen that. Game Night is 2018. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. I, looked, I remember seeing so that. So we both knew that you meant Game Night. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty But funny. you still got Date Night wrong. But I got Game Night wrong, right, because I thought I was thinking Game Night. You might have gotten it right. Let's, I did let's, get it right. Let's double check. Let's double check. You know, it doesn't hurt to be completely fact-checked. Date uh, Game Night. 2018. Congrats. Got it. Too bad it wasn't my question, though. Too bad your question wasn't the question you thought you get. You asked... Well, it says date night 2010 in my. You document. already said that it was the you meant game night, so it's too late. I win. You didn't win shit. Movie pop quiz time. I win. What city does Breaking Bad take place in? Um, starts with an A. Hold on, <laughs> I should know this. Oh my god, I'm blanking. It's something. What is it? New Mexico. You've driven through Albuquerque. It. Yeah, Albuquerque. All right. John Bernthal co-starred with Ewan McGregor in what film? John Bernthal and Ewan McGregor? Yes. In a movie? In a movie. In like a real, like a movie they movie? They did it in real life. Like they did it? Did it. <laughs> real hard. <laughs> um, hmm. She's not in the island. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ber Bernthal didn't blow up till Wolf. He's not in Star Wars. <laughs> He stars them all, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Ghost Rider. He's Ghost his agent. Oh, Ghost Rider. The Ghost Rider. No yeah. shit. John Bernthal plays his agent. His agent, remember? They're having sushi, and then he calls them a couple of times. It's Bernthal. Bernthal plays his writing agent. He's the one that gets him the the ghost writing gig for the X Men. Pierce Brosnan. Yeah. yeah. That's an earlier Jern, but John Bernthal role where I was like, this guy's good. I don't know. I've never seen him. I think that was the first thing I ever saw him in anything. Yeah. Oh, no. First thing was Walking Dead. Never mind. Scratch that. Scratch that. Erase it. All right. Hey, speaking of scratch that, we got any haters? Any Raider haters? Raider haters. We got? Oh, yeah. We got some. What's that? I think I just accidentally quoted the Willy Wonka trailer. Scratch that. Erase it. Flip it or something. <laughs> What's he say? You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> kind of. Uh, I don't think anybody liked that trailer, honestly. His whimsical voice. Yeah, I don't think anybody liked that trailer. Okay, but I'm it's sure not that I didn't like it. I just, sure, it just, it just a little, wasn't a little underwhelmed. Yeah. All right, MK wrote, in I posted a Darth Maul clip from Solo, uh, Star Wars story, and how he wasn't the villain. And MK wrote, it really is kind of a tie into Clone Wars and Rebels on this one, boys. Unsubscribed. Eliza M. Wizard. Anthony Gaslighting James about Bottoms being an A24 movie. Unsubscribed. Can I say that again? Anthony Gaslighting James about Bottoms being an A24 movie. Bottoms? Uns yeah. I'm sorry. Uns <laughs> Bottoms. You're, no, you're just going, you're, you're, you're mumbling through. I couldn't understand what you're saying. Anthony Gaslighting James about Bottoms being an A24 movie. Thank Unsubscribe. Thank you. I knew it was an A24. It's MGM. I knew it. I saw a tweet about it. It was Letterboxd that made the tweet to go see it, and I thought it was A24. So, hey, I'm sorry I gaslit you. It's okay. But I thought I was right. It's not like I knew I was wrong and I was just gaslighting you. But I did gaslight the shit out of you. I made you believe it. Just like you gaslit me the week before about that thing I was correct about. 
Oh yeah, what was it? <laughs> Storm did it in the in the comments in an episode previously. What was um? Crap, I'll try to think of it. Keep going. Yeah, I just love the evidence here. I'll go. I'll go through the goddamn episodes and find it. I hope you do. I will. I hope. I can't wait to see it. I have access to everything. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's it. We didn't have that many unsubscribes this, this uh, past week. We have a five-star review from Michael Fillinger on Apple Podcasts. Michael! All you need is an email, by the way, to leave a review. Best show. Is this five-star review enough? Thank you, Michael. We appreciate you so much. Appreciate you. Uh, but I think you're right. I think I was just... I think I told you something was true that was false. Oh, 100%. You gaslight me pretty often. You gaslight me too. You Where's like the evidence? <laughs> Prove it. Exactly my point. I don't, I don't have, we don't have any tape of it. There's no video evidence whatsoever. We have tons of video evidence of you gaslighting me. Oh, really? Like what? Like the ones we're talking about. Specifically, like what? Just the one you brought up. Uh-huh. Someone even said you were gaslighting me. One thing. <laughs> the other thing that you admitted you agreed with that you couldn't think of right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Jack it Sparrow last conversation. Episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is because you watched Pirates of the Caribbean last night. It's awesome, man. I'm going to watch the trilogy. It's pretty great. Because um, you got Hulu, and Hulu has the Pirates movies. We did, it's di Yeah, it's Disney, baby. And by the way, I was right with Arby's slogan. We have the meats being like similar to Hulu. It's Hulu has the movies. Boom, boom, boom. Arby's, we have the meats. Yeah, so Hulu kind of like took their slogan. A little bit. Anyway. People, they're like, guys, we have movies. So their slogan is, we have movies. <laughs> <laughs> I love how, like, I love how Disney tries to hide that they aren't, that Hulu's not Disney. Yeah, yeah. That, that 20th century is not Disney, but Hulu's like 100% Disney. I gotta say, Hulu it has not that great of a selection of movies. It, I feel like it used to be. It better. has like 20 good movies, and then it's just like, what? They have some like weird movies as like their, their home screen banner movies. Must just be licensing issues because they have 20th Century Studios. I mean, I think that Disney prefers to sell licensing to all their library rather than yeah. putting them on. And Hulu has become like a TV destination more than movie destination. True. Yeah. My streaming recommendation for this episode is going to be a show on Hulu, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's still going. It's still on there. It's still great. Did you hear about Ryan Reynolds? He said he wants to guest star as uh, Mac's boyfriend. Max in the boyfriend. next season. I hope that happens. Oh my god, that, <laughs> that was so be amazing. Funny. I also had a Hulu recommendation. Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Curse of the Black Pearl. It's fucking awesome. I gave it five stars in Letterboxd. Let's get back into the bear. There's a lot to talk about. Now, I got some lists I'd like to run through first, and then we can go through some character stuff. Man, I love your lists. So Let's IMDB's go. highest rated episodes of the bear include season two, episode seven, Forks, which is the Christmas episode at a 9.7. That's very high. Season two, episode eight. I'm sorry. Forks is not Forks the Christmas is not, episode. It's the, yeah. when Richie goes to the dining restaurant. Sorry. Season two, episode eight. Fishes is a 9.6. So Forks, 9.7. Fishes is the Christmas episode, 9.6. Season one, episode seven. Review is a 9.5. This is when Sydney's meal that she makes, that short, short rib, rib actually gets yeah. into an article. That looks then, so good with the risotto. And that's a big episode because that's when Sydney quits and Marcus quits and Carmi has that's that That's the long take. That's, yeah. yeah that's, Carmi has that huge freak out. It's, the whole episode isn't a wonder, but it's like after two minutes, the wonder starts. The finale has a yeah. great couple, a couple great wonders yeah. and long takes and the restaurant opening nights. And then season two, episode 10, The Bear, the finale, is a 9.4. So those are the top four rated episodes of The Bear, according to IMDb. I like to talk about the food as well. And these are some of the best looking dishes from the show. Obviously, the beef sandwiches look great. So don't those hot dogs from the beef. And then also the T-bone they make oh at the bear. Oh, my God, with the sauce. And the, the bone si it's sideways on the dish looks incredible. I love the prawns. The yeah. prawns look great, too. The omelets that you brought up earlier that Sydney makes for Natalie, it looks sensational. Yeah, that was viral online. It looks incredible. The spaghetti, there's a couple of sequences of spaghetti getting made. I think the best looking one is probably when Carmen's making spaghetti for Claire at his home. We don't get to see them eat it because they just get to business right away. The, cano <laughs> the cannolis, both the ones in Fish's episode as well as the savory ones that Marcus makes all look delicious. The pistachio cannolis. I love Chef Luca's minty snickers bar creation whatever that gelatin concoction is looks awesome as well as just the the attention to detail and how much work went into it tastes like a minty snickers bar doesn't it didn't it in it <laughs> <laughs> the 
the Christmas feast in general, everything looked sensational and delicious. Except the tuna casserole. Yeah. <laughs> I love that everyone's reaction to Pete bringing the tuna casserole. Don't fucking let her see it. What's wrong with you? Why are you trying to fuck Why with you this doing this to me? Why are you doing Why this, you do this to me? <laughs> and then the mango tart that Sydney eats. She eats a ton of food. In one of these episodes, in the one two. where she's touring food, it's yeah. it's a it's like I I literally that episode ended of Sydney trying all the food around the city, and I went to the store and got chocolate gelato. Yeah, I had to. That tart looks great. And speaking of, I, I have a, a section of odd moments, and this includes there's a few things off for sequences in the show for me. And so season two, Sydney and Carm, they're testing out things in Carm's kitchen. The they're cooking stuff, and sure. then they're supposed to go out to taste food, right? And then Carmen blows off Sydney to go see Claire, and Sydney basically just spends the whole day going around the city trying food. She eats so at much twenty-five food. locations. I was, How yeah. could you possibly eat all that food in one day and not die? So I love, I love the montage. It's great, yeah. but it would have been better if it was over a week because not only is it like so much food, but also she's having conversations with people she used to know and work with, and like a former boss, and it's like. You know how much time that would just... It's like three hours just to do one of them. But she has so much food in yeah. that episode. I'm yeah. just like, how could a human being possibly eat all how this? How is she walking after this? Is she puking after she eats? Because I was, it was like a 10-minute montage yeah. that they kept going back to. It was cool. I, I love food it. montages. But when you see that her outfit is the same... I'm like, is this really the same night? She <laughs> eats like pastries in the morning. She has that egg sandwich. She has fucking everything. She's yeah. going all over the city eating a crazy amount of food. And I'm watching And then the like, ice cream sundae. I'm like, how can she possibly be eating all this food? Even on Thanksgiving, <laughs> I don't eat even close to that amount of food. <laughs> Holy sh... I was watching that like, what is going on right now? Yeah. So that sequence... I liked it, but you're right. It, it should have taken place over the course of the week. It just made no sense to me with the, how much she was eating. I agree. I, I, I think that it was just like, that. It, it was too much. And, but not, not even just the food, but just like, she's con she's conversing with all these people at these spots. Like, she's not having like, if realistically, she's not having like too many conversations. She's like having hour-long <laughs> conversations with them, plus travel and stuff. It's impossible to fit just the time in there. It would have been, it's like a 40-hour day that she yeah, did in three legit. hours. Yeah, And 17 meals. And I know she probably <laughs> didn't finish every dish because she's just tasting, but still, she eats a lot of food in that episode. A lot Certainly. of food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, I got a Marcus problem with oh, this show. Oh, my God. Same. So, not that I don't. I, I think Mark is a good ca good character, and I love him baking stuff and everything. But he's got horrible timing. So these two big moments where Marcus has the worst timing, and it seems a little forced for conflict. Yeah. So Marcus, while Carmen is in the weeds at the beef, and has been ma asking Marcus for cakes all day, and this is the episode where they have their new online ordering system. It's the oneer. And it's the oneer, and also this is the review episode where. They get a ton of attention because of this braised short rib. And it's the new system where you can order online and do takeout at the same time. And they open up shop, but they get, like, hundreds of orders immediately. Yeah, it, Sydney, it's a shit show. Sydney did something about, like, an option error where just that – it. I think that used to be – I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it prevented any kind of delay. And, like, if, if they sold out of an item – it wouldn't say that, yeah. so it just like kept people kept ordering. so hundreds and hundreds of tickets yeah. are coming in right when they open up shop, and it's supposed to be a great day. And all morning, Carmen was asking Marcus for cake because he hadn't made the cakes yet. He's just been working on his donuts. I understand it's a restaurant; you're trying to experiment, and you got a little passion going on with your donuts. But Marcus didn't make any of the goddamn cakes, and Carmen's in the weeds, losing his mind. He's having a freak out because of what's going on in the restaurants. And, you know, if they have a bad day, they're gonna go out of business, basically. And so while he's freaking out, Marcus comes up to him with the donut, which is like a big, like a big kid smile, like, "Hey, man, I figured out the donut recipe." Carmen's like, "Where the fuck? Are you, where are the cakes? Why are you doing this to me? Why, why are you doing this to why, me? Why are you doing this to me? Where are the cakes? Why are you fucking with me? Why aren't you making the cakes, Marcus?" I. I I also agree that was a really great episode, but that moment took me out of it because Mark, because Carmi was having a fucking psychotic meltdown, screaming like a maniac, and then Marcus just walks up to him like, "Hey man, I finally figured out the sauce." It's just like, what? Can you read He's the room, been asking bro? Asking for cakes all morning. Yeah, read the room, bro. I get it. Three times he asked him for cakes, and then Marcus quits, and then Sydney quits that that shift. But I, and also, but Marcus he takes all of his donuts and throws them onto like the table in the front of house in the dining room, and I was like, for me, I was like. He's acting like a baby. Like, it's a crazy situation. You're upset that he's mad at you because you didn't do your job. Yeah. Marcus I thought it was like, yeah. you should be making cakes, man. Make What's the cakes. What's going on? <laughs> he asked you three times to make cakes. Yeah. You have the biggest day of the beef's history right now. 
He's not making cakes. So I, that, I also agree. That took me out of that episode. I was like, what is Marcus doing here? Yeah. And another another Marcus moment that's horrible timing. So the day the bear opens, which is I couldn't remember, is this the finale or the one the before? The penultimate. The penultimate. So the, the second to last episode. They're about to open their shift and they're just prepping for that day. It's the biggest day. Oh, I'm day. sorry. This is the final. Okay, yeah, biggest final. day of their lives. You know, Sydney and Carmen, this is their restaurant. They're finally gonna open. Ten months of hard work has gone into this restaurant. Everything has to go perfect. They're prepping. They're trying to stay focused. Trying everything done, and the shift's starting. And they're getting in the weeds. And Sydney's running Expo. She's calling out the dishes and planning everything. And there's a lot of tickets coming in, and it's getting busy. It's the first night they have to work out the kinks, basically. And so she needs help at Expo with the tickets. So Carmen asks Marcus to help. Sydney with the tickets help her organize everything he's like yes chef no problem so he goes over while Sydney is so stressed and oh you know this is before they open this is when they're prep never mind so yeah before they're prep yeah so when when they're prepping for the for the night before the restaurant opens sorry sorry so so for okay she's checking his station so so he asks her out before the shift starts and I'm thinking when could she possibly go out with you? He asked if we could either go before or later tonight. You're going to go out to eat before the opening night of your restaurant, The Bear, that you've all been working 10 months on. You're going to go out. You're going to ask her out now to go out, out to eat before the shift. She has put her entire life into this restaurant. And she's the coach. And they're working. <laughs> and they're working. They're trying to prep. And what, afterwards when she's going to be at a At midnight? Mess? Where are you going to go to eat at so midnight? So I'm like, what is he asking her out for? Because obviously he creates this weird dynamic now. Horrible timing. And then, obviously, then the expo situation where she, he goes to help her. And they kind of get into a bickering argument. And then he thinks she's ignoring him. And he, he freaks out on Sydney saying, are you ignoring me because you're mad at me? And then she's like, I can't deal with this right now. I completely agree. That was another moment where Marcus was being a baby, being way too sensitive. But also the motivation. I understand that they're trying to get some conflict with the interpersonal relationships. But for me, those two instances with Marcus kind of took me out completely out of the situation when they should have when their their intention was to make good conflict i was like come on bro you're acting like a bitch come on <laughs> he is but he like, was to, to ask he's her- like you're going to scream at your boss on the line that she's mad at you for in ignoring you because you asked her out for some reason on she the didn't... most important day of her life yeah i i thought it was just like really selfish and so i think they are kind of forcing it a little bit with marcus when they don't have to force things like I think eventually we're, this is hinting that he and Cindy are going to start a thing. I'm not sure that it's being shown, like, it's being hinted properly. Yeah, because he went over her house after they both quit the beef in yeah. season one. He's over her house, and she, she cooks him dinner. It's a sweet scene. It's nice. It seems like Sydney just wants to be friends, but it seems like yeah. Marcus wants more. And obviously there's a little tension there. He is there. a little flirty with her, too, yeah. in, the, in the kitchen. But she doesn't seem to be interacting with that kind of intention which that's that's what how i interpret it she doesn't want to be romantically involved with i think anyone at the restaurant and i would agree either like yeah. you don't want that in your life <laughs> but the timing with marcus for this for the story for the character it just a lot of it doesn't make sense and it's i think it's just a quick force conflict to like what can we do to spice things up with the scene yeah and it just doesn't make sense like why would you ask your boss out this to go out to dinner when you're supposed before to before be- you're supposed to open your restaurant that you invested eight hundred thousand dollars on in, in in every day of your life for a year basically yeah and Sydney it's had odd. and in Sydney's reaction like she walks away she's like fuck 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 she's like this guy really just asked me out that's yeah. how I look at it yeah it was pretty weird I don't like those two moments of just horrible timing on Marcus's parts yeah I agree but the donuts look great <laughs> the donuts look really good I would have I would have liked it better if maybe he already had the had been trying. To want to be a baker, but he, I think a it was pastry chef, pastry chef, but he was stuck baking bread at this restaurant. Yeah, you know I mean, I that, think that would have worked. I think that he became too good too fast in a way, just from reading books. And he, he spends a week in Copenhagen, but I think it would have, it, it could have worked a little bit better if he had always had the intention of being a pastry chef, but he couldn't quite make it. And then how he stuck making bread rolls for this sub shop. I think that would have been, a, and then. It would make it a little bit more believable for him to make such incredible dishes that these two highly trained chefs who know everything there is about food to love his meals immediately. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I, I think I agree with that a little bit. It's just a, it's a meteoric rise. Yeah. It's too meteoric. Too I meteoric. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are so many great stressful moments of the show, too. Some of my favorites include... Obviously, the beef in the weeds with their new online takeout system after Sydney's dish makes it in that article it leads to Carmen's biggest freakout and Sydney and Marcus quitting. Carmen getting locked in the walk-in fridge opening night and accidentally confessing to Claire that he doesn't want to be with her when he thinks he's talking to Tina. Very stressful. Because uh, I was like, what are they going to do to Carm? How is he going to fuck shit up? Season 2, it can't go smoothly. The finale cannot go smoothly for Carmen. It can go smoothly for the restaurant, which it seems to do, but... With him and Carmen, I mean, him and Claire, it's fucked. And him and Richie seems fucked now, too, because they have that, that crazy argument. It might be the biggest fight they've had, it looks like. Big blowout. Um, but I love that shot, too, of this, the side shot of either on each either side of it's like the, the walk-in. It's really yeah. great. Michael and Lee at Christmas at the dinner before Donna comes in when they're all waiting in the forks and throwing the forks at Lee. That is so tense and excellent. And I was just like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And every scene with Donna basically is stressful. Yeah, she's very stressful to talk to and be with. And then Richie's freakouts, especially the freakout on Sydney, is very stressful. Yeah, Richie, he's it's very similar. He and Carmi both have extremely bad tempers, absolutely no control of their emotions, and Sydney is often put in these situations of you know what should be just like. A discussion turns into a fucking psychotic blowout that she's often like the the victim of and i think that's one of the most stressful parts for her of working there is dealing with richie and dealing with carmy where it's either one of them is just gonna fucking scream in her face and it gets to the point that that's one of the reasons why she quit it wasn't just for that one moment but like just it was all building up to her quitting that day and that's why when richie transforms and then he's the rest, the opening of the bar bear is going badly. Everything's chaotic. The expo's weeded and overwhelmed. But Richie's like, cool, I got it. He's got a completely new temperament, which you get. They highlighted really well by showing stressful situation. He used to freak out, or he used to cause the stressful situation. But now he's handling it. Now he's a fixer in a way, and he has, for the time being. I'm sure it won't last, but he seems to have a lot of control over his emotions, which is something Carmi still doesn't have. They're wor Carmi's working on it, but Carmi, I'm not sure he'll ever be able to completely master himself, but it looks like Richie, at the moment, has mastered his emotions. It seems like by the end of season two, he kind of has the upper hand on Carmi, where Carmi looks like he needs Richie more than Richie needs Carmi, because now Richie has purpose in life, and He's got experience, and he has found confidence he's never had before in things that he's good at, which is, you know, being a people person, seeing patterns, and being a great hostess and, and hospitality manager. I mean, he's he kills it. He does he does a great job in the last two episodes, Richie the character. He's just one of the most essential components of the bear working in the finale. Yeah, and I really like Sydney. I believe that she's she can definitely be looked at as partly inspired by the creator because he said he used to frequent this beef shop that he used for inspiration to make the show, and Sydney reveals that the beef was her dad's favorite place. And she used to come go there a lot when she was a kid, and that's why she wants to work there, because Carmi sees her resume. She's overqualified, like, why do you want to be here? And she's like, it's, it has a connection to my, my childhood. But that's not why she works there. She's it's because of Carmi, yeah. yeah. Because she, the best meal she had in, yeah, was yeah. at Carmi's restaurant. So, that's, yeah. so she's working where Carmi is. And I love... How even though when we learn about Will Poulter's character in Honeydew in, Amps, in Copenhagen and he tells a story about like when he, he thought he was the best chef and every kitchen he worked in he was number one but then he saw the real number one and there's this guy who was so good and so committed that Will Poulter's character would never, he realized he would never be number one. He would never be the best cook, best chef because this guy exists. But that guy took him under his wing and made him better at everything. It made him better than ever he ever thought he could be. And I think we all knew he was talking about Carmi, but he never named him. And then in, in the Forks episode, when Richie's walking through the hallway of the, the fancy restaurant, and there are photos, framed photos of all the, the head chefs that have worked there in the past since its opening, one of the photos is of Carmi and Will Poulter. And you're like, yep, that's who he was talking about. Luca, Luca thank you. 
Yeah, I really like that Copenhagen sequence of, of I think, obviously, Will Poulter is such a talented actor. I mean, getting guest cameos and stars is... It was cool to see his real accent. Yeah. I think he... I think he, based on interviews I've seen with him, I feel like he put a lot of him... Like, that was very um, true to him as a person. Yeah, he's such a personable actor and energetic, and he, he you know, the... You can't help but take your eyes off him. He's, he just... He's great on camera. And... He brings so much to that short role. You know, he's on camera for like eight minutes total, not even probably. And, and what I really like about this show is, you know, sometimes it's just two chefs cooking something or preparing something, something tedious, peeling mushrooms, chopping portions of, of, of flour. And they're just talking about life. And they always talk about each other. They always ask each other questions like, what was your life like? What was it like growing up? What, uh, what are your parents like? Your siblings? And you really connect with people. And I think that's great because people get away from technology and it's just two people talking and just focus on something and you're kind of getting through it together. And it's, yeah. it shows the the camaraderie that working in a space like a restaurant can really build, but also the the pain and, and the hatred it can, that can also be created at the same time. Yeah, I love the the scene with Olivia Coleman. It was a great little scene. And the show, show sh- translates that its perspective of fine dining in the first season is negative. It's only the negatives because, you know, that's what Carmi takes away from it. The stress, the ex- the extreme formality of it, the lack of, in a sense, humanity in the fine dining world. But the second season with Richie's episode and with um, Copenhagen, you see, you know, the people that work in these restaurants, they do it because they love it. And there is a lot of love and care that goes into that world, into the extremely high society, the extremely high fine dining world. And that's something that I think the second season showcased really well of like seeing like, you know what, it's a crazy work environment. And it's like, yeah, $400 for a meal. The dishes can be ridiculous. But they're not just done just to be fancy. They're done out of the utmost care and kind of like obsession of the cooks wanting to create as special of an experience as possible and how much the love they put into it. And something the show does really well is building tension to a level where it's about to hit a boiling point, but then bringing it down. It's about to hit a boiling point, bringing it down. A lot of that happens with... Carmen and Sydney, and they kind of create that dynamic where, you know, one of them is freaking out on the other one, then they do the sorry and sign. They do the sorry that Carmi teaches her that he learned in restaurants that, like, lets you know, like, all right, I'm sorry, I'm fucking up, even though we're screaming at each other. Look at my hand. I'm apologizing. Let's try to get through this. We're a team. And they have, like, eight moments where they're about to blow out on each other, and then they, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. So I, I think they do a great job of that tension that's rising and, Something bad's going to happen, then, oh, all right, a little ease, and it's a lot easier. And also, Carmi, I think that he abandons the restaurant when he starts hanging out with Claire because it's, it's hinted in the Fishes episode, like, he, he's ne- he never decompresses. When his cousin is like, come on, live with me in New York for a little bit. You need to get away. You need to relax. You need to decompress. He's never taken a break in so many years, and so... For him, Claire seems to be like, oh, I can finally loosen up. I can finally, you know, take some time off. I can finally decompress. And so I think that's why he jumps at the opportunity of spending time with Claire as opposed to spending time with Sydney in the restaurant. But in a way, you know, when he when he's in that walked in locked in the walk in, you know, for the he was the cause of the lock breaking. He never called the fridge guy to get it fixed, even though he said he would. He also feels like he he says he failed them to Tina because you know all the tape is torn off in a messy way as opposed to being cleanly cut with scissors which it's just, it's like the fine details weren't done for the restaurant so it was in in his eyes the restaurant is a failure because it's not perfect and he, and he realizes it's not perfect because I was committing too much time to Claire and not enough time to the restaurant not enough time to Sydney who I kind of left um, hanging so many times and so that conversation of Sydney and Carmi under the table when they're both making adjustments to that hook on either side of the table, and he says, you know, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't given you 100% of my time and my commitment, and I should have, and it's not going to happen again. And he's made a decision to forego any kind of social life and forego human connection and the, a possibility of love, and he's going to commit himself completely to the restaurant. 
Yeah, and that's basically what uh, Jimmy says to him right before opening when he sits him down and gives him the business certificate. And he tells him that story about the Cubs, the Chicago Cubs, blowing it in the playoffs. And everyone blames, no one blames Alex Gonzalez, who had that really bad error in the field. Everyone just goes back to the guy in the stands who obviously bumped into Moises Alou trying to catch that foul ball, one of the most iconic moments in Cubs history. And people would say it's a curse, but they didn't, everyone just blames him versus the several errors that were committed by the team after the foul ball mishap. And so he's telling him, like, you don't want to be the Alex Gonzalez and keep making mistake after mistake after mistake. Don't be him, not the other guy in the stands. Like, that's who you shouldn't be. So basically, the real fault. You have yeah. to focus. You have to, this is, have to, has to be your life. And that's why when Bear, I mean, when uh, Carmi tells him, I've been seeing someone, Jimmy's like, oh, man. I mean, uh -oh. otherwise I would have, he goes, that would have been the best news yeah. I've ever heard. But, uh-oh, or oopsies. You're fucked. <laughs> you can't date her. <laughs> yeah, so it is tragic, and it's kind of it's reminiscent of a movie of movies like Whiplash and La La Land of committing yourself to your craft and uh, abandoning trying to be in a relationship to give yourself wholeheartedly, one hundred percent. Because Sydney's ready for that. Sydney wants the star, and Carmi says, if you want that, you have to care about everything, and you have to, you know, immerse yourself into perfection and so she's on board for that and i think carmy he feels like i owe it to her to get on board with it too yeah and overall i really enjoyed bidging the f the hell out of the show it was excellent and i can't wait to see what they do with season three with the the main conflicts i wonder if the debts are going to become a problem probably with jimmy because they have 18 months to make that loan back and they have basically six months to less than six months to become profitable which is fast for a restaurant especially a new one especially one that has such high cost in terms of the ingredients that they're spending and how much they put into it so i would say the star might be the main goal and yeah getting the, the star getting the star so yeah because their profit margin is terrible so they need to get a star quickly to get attention there and I, I think that'll probably be the main conflict, yeah, of season three. Probably getting that star. Trying to make perfection happen. And then maybe Claire comes back into Carmen's life, which I, I hope because I really like Claire as she's a character. She's great. Yeah. She's very sweet and wholesome, and I think it's something that Carmen needs in his life. I think Carmen needs something good. But Carmen can never... He'll, they'll, they won't get the star if he doesn't abandon her, so... Maybe they can make it work. It's because, you know, I feel bad for Richie because he says, like, can't you just accept one good thing happening in your life? And, like, I'm, and like he and Carmi was so upset with him and Mikey when they put in the good word for him when they ran into Claire. He's been in love with her since, his, since he was a kid. So it's sad that he won't accept that, even though it's there. It's for him. He, he, she's waiting for him, basically. But not anymore. Yeah. And listening to that voicemail is so sad. Yeah, it was a tragic voicemail. Man. You a lot. And he's just like, fuck. <laughs> Man, I love the show. I can't wait for season three. They did, a, they did a great job with the second season. It was an excellent, excellent second season. All right. Well, thanks so much for tuning into our episode of The Bear. Be sure to share this episode with anyone you know who loves The Bear because we had a great time watching the show, and I'm sure they'll love listening to this episode or watching on Spotify or YouTube. Thank you so much for being a patron of the show. You can sign up at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast and leave those five-star reviews on Spotify and Apple. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks, Chef. Let, let it rip, dude. <laughs> this episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian Singleton, Tyler McFly, Andrew Hagen. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Raiders of the Lost podcast is a mirror image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.